small. Well, I don't know. I mean, he's going to be. You don't get any chats right away. Okay. No. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Shear. I'm the town of Clifton Park historian, and I'm here to introduce uh, this afternoon's session. But before I do, I uh, wanted to remind you all to do your evaluations and uh, uh, and bring them to the, the desk there. Also, your name tags. Uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind just turning those in before you leave as well. I mean, we don't really need to wear these around the house, do we? I mean, <laughs> and it'll save us money next year. <laughs> So turn in your name tags and your evaluation reports. Okay, uh, this session is preserving and interpreting historic cemeteries. And the speaker is Zach Studenroth. Uh, Zach co-founded the nonprofit Burying Ground Preservation Group Incorporated in 2018 to provide preservation services to historic cemeteries on Long Island. Zach is a graduate of Columbia University's Division of Historic Preservation in 1978, and currently serves as the Village of Southampton historian on Long Island. I also happen to know that he's worked at two historic sites, including the uh, Lockwood Matthews Mansion in Long Island, and also the Whaling Museum in Cold Harbor. So uh, without further ado, off Zach. Careful not to trip on that cord. We don't want to lose you. Okay. <laughs> not until you turn in your name tag. Then after that, it's perfectly all right. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for sticking around. I know this is the last session. And uh, typically, we see a migration out to the parking lot with everyone's suitcases and stuff, because after, after several days, you're naturally kind of eager to head for home. Um, and then, of course, we have the, we still have the actual outdoor hands-on tented workshop down at the Riverside Cemetery. And some of you, of course, are here as a kind of a prologue to that. Uh, so I'll just brief word of explanation. Uh, obviously, we have very little control over the weather. And um, it's actually even better than was forecast a couple of days ago. Uh, but the cemetery has graciously uh, extended the use of their chapel, which is a wonderful building, as a sort of an initial staging ground. So we'll each go there uh, for an introduction to the cemetery. And there are, there's a restroom there, which is very handy. Uh, and then they have offered to tent over a section uh, that's adjacent where some stones are that we could uh, work on a bit. So, uh, but I don't think we're going to be out there until four o'clock this afternoon. It seems to me we'll get started on or about one o'clock and then we'll go outside. And if the weather is deteriorating, we might we'll do some hands on work and look at what that's all about. But um, I'm not easily offended. You won't hurt my feelings if you decide by one o'clock or so that it's time to jump in the car and head for home. Uh, in fact, we all may sort of pack it in early, certainly not at four o'clock. So we'll, we'll sort of play that by ear, but we are set up to go out there. Brief directions, I know some of you are rather local nearby, you know where the site is, but if you head south on 481, which seems to be the only way to get here and to leave, those of us who don't know the area, that's our, you know. Um, so you head down 481 and on the left, you'll see St. Peter's Catholic Cemetery. And that's not it. And then um, there's an immediate, the road sort of turns and I believe it's Route 57 that is a turn off to the right. And that is the continuation of the river road. And it's just not even a half a mile down on 57. So that's where it is. And you'll see the uh, house, there's a building right by the entrance gate. And we've been told that we can just park anywhere, that parking off to the edge of the drive is, is fine. So you'll see the stone chapel right in front of you. And that's, that's where we're gonna gather. So that's that housekeeping. In any event, um, so this, my presentation now is, a bit of an introduction to that, but it's more general uh, for those of you who are interested in this whole aspect. It's my contention, because I've gotten quite involved, as John said, in creating this uh, nonprofit organization. The reason for that is, of course, we don't make any money at this anyway, so we might as well call it a nonprofit. 
Uh, it also gives us an opportunity to work with uh, organizations, even churches, municipalities, for doing grant writing, which we can offer as a service in the hopes of raising some money. So many of these sites don't really have resources to work with to do the work that could be done. And so we're looking to facilitate that in that way. So we do quite a bit of grant writing, especially in December and January when you can't do all that much work out of doors. Uh, so I'm calling this historic cemeteries as a resource for public engagement. The focus here for me uh, is how can we use these local historical sites as a way of engaging either membership in historical societies or just building on our local history. I'd be willing to say um, you're all here for a reason. It's not because you've seen a cemetery, an old cemetery in your lifetime. I'm sure you have one or two in your locality. Uh, the actual ownership or stewardship responsibilities may be ambiguous. That's not uncommon, uh, but I'm sure there's work to be done. I encounter the uh, attitude all the time uh, that, well, they're supposed to look like that, I'm told. And I'm thinking, well, I'm actually a building guy originally, and I'm thinking if I saw an old house with, with a roof half off, I wouldn't say, geez, it's, it's an old house, it's supposed to look like that. Uh, but there is this sense, because so many old cemeteries fall into disrepair, it's a natural process, uh, there is this sensibility that, well, that's the way they look. Well, actually, yes, that is the way many of them look, but they don't have to look like that. And by doing some repair work, um, you bring, you, you add many years of, of uh, lifetime to these stones. And then you say, well, what's the point of that? And I have found that in many instances, that carved stone, that relic, that artifact is a record and it may be the only record of that person. So, because if you look back at the history of record keeping outside of family Bibles, and if you en enrolled or, uh, in a militia or you were baptized in a church, those scatterings of records um, exist unevenly. And the further back in time you go, the fewer of those exist. So that headstone with the carving, if you can still decipher it, may well be the only record of that person's life. And we will actually see an example of that here. So, so we're doing two things. We're, we're looking at repairing, cleaning, you know, intervening in the lifetime of, of a stone, and also how can we use those stones in our work as local um, historians. Now, let me see if I can get this going there. Okay, so um, this is typical. You, this might look somewhat like a local cemetery that you have in, in, your, in your place. This is the North End Cemetery in the village of Southampton. Um, a couple of things about this that are of interest. Uh, so this is just getting you the sense that, that we all have these. Uh, this one looks like it's in pretty good shape, uh, but all those gray stones are marble and they all began life white, not gray. They're not soiled, they're covered with biogrowth. And so the approach to so-called cleaning them is primarily that of killing the living organisms, God bless them, uh, they're just struggling for life, but there they are. And, and in some cases, like that big gray monument in the middle, render them, which also has some lichens, um, indecipherable. And so if you're looking at the stone and the information that it can convey, uh, you, you need to be able to read that. At the very least, you need to be able to photograph it and then post that photograph on some accessible website so that others who are searching for that information can find it. Because that biogrowth, even after you kill it, it's gonna come back in a few years. So it's not a permanent fix, but that is, that is the, the cleaning aspect of this. Um, so these are mostly marble. This is a site that dates from the 18th century, uh, but these are mostly 19th century period stones that we're looking at. And then same site, different view. Uh, we have a granite in the foreground. I'm gonna go th quickly through a series of the different materials and that are typical of, of, of a range of centuries, uh, depending upon when your specific village or town was settled, uh, you're gonna have kind of on the earlier end or the later, or maybe a mix. Uh, so you have a granite one here in the foreground. Granite, it's hosting a little bit of lichen, but uh, granite is, is permanent, you know, um, very stable stone, very hard. So, 
rarely suffers for anything more than uh, utes tumbling them down to the ground. And then because of their tremendous weight, they become a difficult stone to repair. Uh, now these I should mention here, just in passing a couple, this is sort of, you know, cemetery 101 time, okay. So two things, these are all facing west. You wouldn't know that from this view, but trust me, they all face west, uh, as did those. So what's that all about? Now, when we go down to Riverside Cemetery today, which is technically known, known as a rural cemetery, uh, oddly enough, because we have big, wonderful rural cemeteries on the outskirts of many cities, New York, Boston, or this was kind of a, an ethic of the Victorian the mid 19th century. And, it, and it, our example here at Riverside, it follows the pattern in which this was a small city that grew rapidly and its smallish burying grounds were scattered around, there were a few of them, but then there became the need to sort of put all that out of town, right? But to do it in a way that, that recreated the concept of the old burying ground into more of a scenic arboretum, if you will, or a park, uh, taking advantage of the natural topography, which the earlier sites didn't. Again, we're all like soldiers, we're all facing to the West, right? Uh, so the rural cemetery, uh, if you found a footstone in that cemetery, I'd be very, very surprised because the ethic of marking the head and the foot with a headstone and a footstone and about six feet in between where the body is laid to rest, that whole ethic is colonial 18th century, early 19th. By the time you get up to about 1850 or so, the, the whole concept of burials has shifted and you're rarely seeing that foot marked. What you will see are the stones facing in toward the roadways that are circulating through this naturalistic setting because if you wanna go out on a Sunday's afternoon and visit you know, Uncle Charlie, you don't wanna be wandering up and down the roads in search of where he is. You can easily spot him off the roadway as you're driving through. So it reflects a, a dramatic shift so there is a difference between the, exp the word, the expression burying ground and cemetery. They are not the same thing, okay? And they shouldn't be used interchangeably unless you have a site which has remained active and open over a long period of time and started in the 18th century, but then say grew, perhaps more land was bought and it continues into the present time or into at least the 20th century, continues as an active site, that becomes a cemetery. So. A burying ground, think of it as a colonial with all those stones facing west. I can't demonstrate it here because you won't see me because it involves lying down on the ground. And I'm gonna do it later, except it's gonna be wet. But the reason for that west east business with the footstone is that when you are laid to rest, uh, later expression, you want to be able to sit up and witness the second coming of Christ which of course in true pagan fashion happens the way the sun comes up. So, I mean, the Christ is rising from the East, just like the sun, right? but, but in this period, in this 18th century, everyone was kind of pretty much on the same page in terms of what our religious beliefs are and what we had to look forward to and expect and all the rest of it. So that's the West East orientation, stone facing headstone, footstone toward the East. And that's the sitting up to witness. If you're, if you're laying in the wrong direction, you're gonna miss the whole thing. Right. And then another eternity will go by. And that's not a desirable thing. Okay. But as far as burying ground goes, that's literally what it is. It's grounds for burying people in. It's, there's, there's no whitewashing this. You've lived your life. Maybe you've passed away prematurely. Whatever the situation is, you've died and you're being buried in the ground. So it's a burying ground. That's exactly what it is. And it's not a burial ground. You won't see that expression, in my experience, in any early town records. Uh, that's kind of just a later, it's the burying ground. Okay. So cemetery, where does that come from? That derives from the Greek for a sleeping chamber. Okay. So when you die in the 18th century, you're not going to sleep. When you die in the 19th century, you're going to your, your eternal rest. There's a whole gentler shift in the understanding of what that whole death mystery is all about. And so the use of the word cemetery comes in and takes the place of burying ground, which sounds kind of harsh. 
you know, that we had a dead body, body and we put it in the ground, we buried it. So that's essentially the difference. So uh, we're calling this, I guess this is cemetery. Mo most of us have cemeteries, but out on, uh, on Long Island, out on the East End, settled in the 1640s, uh, and we'll see some of these stones um, very, very early. Uh, some of them close early enough because they fill up and then they have to replace it. You start in the south end, then you got to open the north end. So some of these early sites even close in the 18th century and our a new one is opened up. So they are technically actually burying grounds. That's it. Some of them remain active and become cemeteries. Whoops, there we go. All right, so is this my next? Yeah. So now we're getting to a little bit of the condition issue. This is a strange part of that cemetery where stones were actually pulled up and reset. And that explains why they're also sort of tidy and in an even row, and uh, they seem a little staged. Well, they are because someone in the 19th century reset them that way, probably from another site where they were endangered. But what we're beginning to see here are some of the conditions that we're gonna be look at, looking at more closely. Um, that heavy buildup of lichens and mold that's discoloring. Um, you can see the upper one to the left, the Herrick stone had a break and it's been repaired. Uh, that can become a problem. That can become a reversible condition uh, if it had been done improperly. And then of course, we've got, a, we've got a whole missing one altogether. The one on the lower right, it's a kind of a base and it seems it's, it's kind of a slot. You can see the one next to it where there's a tablet that's inserted into a base. Well, that empty base next to it, that whole tablet went missing. It must have fallen out, perhaps over the years it broke up and eventually was discarded. That's a super challenging condition because you don't have a stone there anymore. Uh, but that's of our own making. I like to think, you know, we as a people are always improving things. That's kind of a, that's our, that's part of our DNA to reinvent, make it better, make it go quicker, make it sell for less money, make it whatever it is. We're always trying to improve on stuff. Well, this was a terrible invention. Those tablets that you're seeing in the ground are simply buried in the ground. That's all it is, the stone that goes. And typically about half of what you see above ground goes into the ground. So these, this is, you're typically looking at about two thirds of the length of a stone. And it takes that much stone to be set in the ground and to anchor it and to keep it straight. Well, someone in the Victorian era, this would probably be around maybe in the 1850s into the 60s, comes up with a better idea. Why use all that stone and stick it down in the ground? We'll just have a, a big clunky base and carve out a groove that's about three inches deep. And then we'll set that tablet down into that groove and sometimes pin it, sometimes just mortar it in there. Well, that probably lasted the lifetime of the person that installed it. But when you think of like that big stone to the right, which must weigh easily 300 pounds, is inserted into a slot that's three inches deep. What's the likelihood that the frost isn't going to heave the ground around underneath it? And unless that stone is placed absolutely perfectly and no, and no earthquakes come along in the meantime, no tree limbs fall, nothing happens for 200 years. What's the likelihood that that stone is still going to be perfectly plumb? Probably not. And the minute it starts to lean, and then of course some utes could come along and give it an extra push, but that's a very vulnerable and you can see what happens to these stones. That was a short lived invention, thank God, because it didn't really work. Okay, so now I want to briefly go through uh, perhaps some, this may be old news for some of you if, if you work in or, or study your local burying grounds or cemeteries, but I want to quickly go through because the east end of the island was founded so early, we're lucky enough to have a good survival of stone types stretching across the entire history of grave marking. Uh, and we're essentially New England, we're out that far. And at that point, we were mu much more connected up to Connecticut and the mainland that way than we were. It was before the expressway was built. So most people weren't driving down the island into the city. So we're very much a, a kind of a New England settlement in the early period. This one dates 1706. So, and you can see just a hint of the footstone. It's colossal. The footstone itself is probably about three feet high. This colossal brownstone, uh, this is all quarried up in Connecticut. Uh, remember, Long Island is a sandbar. We live on a sandbar. We have no rock to quarry. There are no rocks. 
we have rocks to salvage and mine because they've been tumbled and rolled and pushed down from Connecticut and ended up on the surface or slightly buried. And we'll get to the use of those as grave markers. But conventionally speaking, we have no rock to quarry. That's the difference. You know the difference between a rock and a stone. Okay, okay. Clue is we have headstones, we don't have head rocks. We have hearthstones, we don't have hearth rocks. Okay, so a stone is a rock that's been given a purpose. So it's not about the weight, it's not about the shape, but it is about the shaping. So in other words, the brownstone is quarried as rough it's rock. It's then shaped as a blank and then carved, hauled countless hundreds of miles to be used as a grave marker, and it becomes a headstone. So this one dates 1706. Very, very thick because cruder techniques to work this out of the earth than were later developed. And so these very early stones, we have them dating as early as the 1670s. Uh, Amazing that they're still, when you think of it, has how many historical artifacts do you know of that are still where someone put it 300 years ago? You know, how many hat boxes, how many silver pitchers, how many carved chairs, how many things were crafted and left outdoors because you forgot to bring them inside for God's sakes. And there it is, it's, it's, it's still there. So amazing that we have these, uh, but you see the white is all biogrowth. There's no soil there. So that doesn't need to be cleaned. It needs to be, it needs its biogrowth gotten rid of. And there's a special solution, which I'll discuss briefly later. So the history of brownstone, we evolve uh, down toward the end of the 18th century. In this case, this is Mr. Howell, 1777. You can see his footstone in the background there. Uh, this is an absolutely delightful and mysterious carving. It's a, it's a soul effigy. He's got his he or she uh, with his bulbous sort of uh, baboon-esque nose. Uh, he's flying up to heaven and those Christmas tree ornaments are, you know, perhaps a metaphor or a suggestion of celestial objects because after all we're going up, we're not going down. Uh, this is a, a very fancy high style Connecticut River Valley stone. As I said, we had none of our own. So all of these uh, stones, for those who could afford it, are imported from various other centers of headstone carving. So it's unlikely that you may have, if your village or settlement uh, dates from the late 18th century, you might have uh, one or a few examples of this. And of course, they're especially vulnerable because all that carving exposes them to, to the elements. But at about the same time, even earlier, this is 1723, so earlier in the 18th century is the use of slate. Now realize uh, these are both sedimentary rocks, so they have their problems, but sandstone or brownstone, if you will, is the much softer of the two uh, and tends to, and we'll see what the condition problems are that arise. A slate is a very, very hard sedimentary rock. And if you look carefully, you can see that the carver, he wanted to make his letters all straight, right? So this is Phoebe. Phoebe Wells, uh, and you can see the carver struck lines across the face of the stone so that his letters, he wouldn't go wandering off and go off track. Those very shallow scribed carved marks, which were simply meant as a guide for the lettering, are still plainly visible. And well, it's 1723 there, so we're coming up on 1823. 1923, 2023. We're, we're coming up on a 300th anniversary for this carved stone, which is sitting outdoors, has been its entire life, and that's what it still looks like. We love slate. Now, the problem with slate is if it's struck with a mower or a sledgehammer or a tree limb, it tends to fracture. So it is, it, 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 it's vulnerable to a different type of deterioration, but if you're lucky, you'll have a stone that, that survives looking like this. This has also sunk a little bit, but sunk is not at the top of our list of priorities when it comes to fixing these things. Uh, here's another slate. There's the footstone in the, in the background. This is another, perhaps a sole effigy, but we've got our wings, but this is, this is more of a wig. Okay, this is Edward Herrick, 
And uh, I think um, Mr. Herrick's got his wig on. I think this would qualify as a portrait stone. Sometimes you have these where the portrait is actually caught in three quarter, uh, depending on the skill of the carver. But I would say that's what we're talking about here. And Connecticut doesn't export any slate. This would be somewhere more Massachusetts and hidden toward the coast somewhere. Uh, but that's the relationship. And you will usually, the little footstone, when I say little, that guy is, sits about maybe a foot above ground, whereas the one in the foreground is more like three to four. Uh, they're going to mimic the shape. So uh, why that's important is sometimes the footstone goes missing. It might be leaning against a tree somewhere at the site because the guy that mows the lawn was tired of steering around it because it had fallen over. So he pulls it up and sticks it brings it to safe, safety by a tree, but the tree's on the opposite end of the site. So how do you marry them together? Well, that footstone, I don't have a picture to prove it, but his name is Edward Herrick, and that stone says E-H. So it does. Now that could be Edna Herrick, it could be Eliphalet Herrick, or it could be Edward Howell. So it's not a, you know, but you work with what you've got. And oftentimes, if the headstone has deteriorated beyond legibility, but the footstone remains in place, at least you can fairly quickly determine whose burial site that is, even if the headstone itself has, has suffered. Um, and now we get into marble. So the thing, and these, these again, these are all kind of dreary and gray. They're, they're discolored with gray and green. That is all biogrowth. These ought to look like the white plastic fence in the background, because that's how they started life. Now, there's no way now to safely bring any old marble stone back to its initial appearance. But in repairing, cleaning, you know, addressing all these conditions, the uh, objective is never that of making it look new again. You, know? you want to. Uh, bring these stones into safety so they're not about to fall and break. They're not being driven over by the lawnmower. They're not about to topple uh, or they're not half buried in the ground anymore. So those are the objectives, not to make things look brand new. And in this case, luckily these marble stones have not, the surfaces have not deteriorated uh, to any extent. So all of that, even the verse here um, can, can be read and that's usually the first thing to go. So these are marble, and marble comes in directly after the Revolutionary War. Uh, coincidentally, some, somewhere around the 1790s, uh, uh, large quantities of marble, very high quality white marble were found in Southern Vermont. This would be Dorset and some of those other communities. And it was mined there extensively. Um, and it could be mined more cheaply, as it turns out, technology was ca catching up and it could be quarried and finished and transported more affordably. Uh, and it, it, it pretty much pushes brownstone. Slate is long gone by now, but the brownstone is kind of pushed to the back. So marble takes over by about 1800, pretty uniformly right through the century, right down to, let's say the 1880s or so. And there's a reason for that because here's granite, here's Mr. Howell. Yes. Uh, well, marble is still, uh, it's still being used, but as a preferred stone type. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The question was, what was the end date uh, of the use of marble for uh, grave markers? And it really continued right through the entire 19th century. But by the 1880s into the 1890s, a rival stone type comes on which the technology by then had developed to the point where it could be successfully quarried, shaped into headstones, carved, transported, and that is granite. And what we're looking at here is Peter Halleck, it's a granite stone, which is, you will often see a combination of two different kinds of granite. You've got uh, a very dark gray that's highly polished, and then the lighter gray that's shaped. Uh, and by this period, you're getting more complicated, complex, uh, monuments that, that, that aren't simply single tablets or even a single tablet sitting on one of those bases that we, that we saw earlier that didn't kind of work out so well. By now you have these extremely heavy slabs of granite that have been shaped and stacked 
into a complex uh, marker such as this. And the only thing that this is suffering from is it needs a little cleaning. All that green is, is uh, algae or some sort of biogrowth. So those are the primary ones, the brownstone, the slate, the marble, and the granite. And that's kind of the uh, succession of stone types from the late 17th century right up, right up through, in fact, to the present day. Universally, I know from personal experience when I was getting all nostalgic and thinking, I want to get a stone marker for, I want a white marble for my dad for now, because I like it. Well, it costs more than granite because the, they're not set up to sell marble for that purpose, at least where I was shopping in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And so to continue to use marble is the reverse situation. It is not the preferred stone type anymore, and that became my old specialty. So we went with a white granite and called it a day. Um, but there are a couple of other stone types uh, you may see from time to time, especially if you are relatively near a source, the foundry, or you know, I guess you'd call it a foundry, uh, for this was Bridgeport, Connecticut. This is metal, it's hollow, it's pure zinc. Zinc is the metal that you see that gets flashed onto your trash cans that makes them sort of grayish and sort of mottled looking. This is pure zinc cast in a mold but zinc didn't sound like such a convincing marketing uh, term. So the manufacturers of these called it white bronze. And white bronze markers like this were sold beginning in the 1870s. And what put them out of business was the First World War, it was basically the lack of the metal that, that could be used for them. But you can see what's quite wonderful about it. at the very bottom, we've already seen a, a, a granite with a stacked base and sub base, et cetera. The bottom base on this, and that's all one piece of metal, four sided. So those are four sides of a casting and then soldered together. But the very bottom looking like a separate base is rusticated in such a way that it looks like stone. They were competing for their market share and sort of making it look like a conventional stone carved artifact. Uh, the sales literature for these things still survives to some extent, and they would tout all of the advantages for using these metal markers instead of the stone, one of which was that nothing will grow on it, and such as moss and algae, whatever, lichens, and that is absolutely true. This thing is just about as clean as the day. It, it might have a little bit of streaking, but that's probably actually airborne soil and whatnot that's gotten on there that could be easily cleaned. But no living creature wants to live on a zinc marker, trust me. Uh, but they never really gained a, a big market share. They go out in the, uh, as I said, by the First World War. But one of the real selling points was you can see there's a panel, there's a recessed panel in the middle there as the obelisk begins to, to uh, narrow. One of them is empty. You see the one to the right is, is black. You're looking into the inside of that casting. The way these were made is that this is the Rogers family, apparently, and each of those four sides was a, was a separate plate that, could, that would be bolted in place. And so when you bought it to begin with, and let's say you're memorializing, you know, Harry Rogers. So you get that one plate and it says, in memory of Harry Rogers and the date and whatever you wanna say. And the other three sides just have something, some sort of a metaphor. It might be a cross, it could be a weeping willow. It's just, a, just a, something decorative. Because when Harry's wife, Mahitable passes on, you unscrew one of the plates and you order one and you screw, you, you, you get Mahitable in there. So you could, th these were updatable, okay? which was harder in granite, right? So that was one of the big selling points, uh, but it ultimately went out of business and they suffer from the sort of vandal vandalism that you see here. People will walk off of those plaques because they, they can unbolt them. Yes, we have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not following our protocol. We have we have a circulating microphone. Great. Thanks, Matt. 
Jason Parkman, Town of Elbridge historian. Yeah. Um, what are the telltale signs to easily identify the zinc or white bronze versus like some of the other stones? Because that looks very much like any it, of the other stone ones there. It does. Well, there are two things that, that automatically tell you what it is. First of all, when you enter a cemetery, if it's not your first cemetery and not your first zinc, from about a half a mile, you'll be like, there's one. Because, as I said, not being able to host any algae, lichens, etc., they achieve this sort of gunmetal, dull gray, which it doesn't vary across the, the stone very much. They're quite distinct in their appearance. And if you have any question, you go up to it and you give it a little. I'm glad this is metal and not wood. And it's hollow, and 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 and, and you can tell right off the bat, you know. So never hugely popular, but uh, but definitely present. Many places will perhaps have one, one or two. I don't know about pricing, but I suspect that they were priced very competitively to sort of win. Uh, this again is in the age in which granite is becoming more and more prevalent, very heavy, very costly to transport. So these stones, certainly so-called stones had a, had a market share. And then finally, we all have field stones wherever we live. On Long Island, we call, they're, they're technically glacial erratics because they're chunks of rock that were pushed down to create Long Island. And when the glaciers retreated, were left behind. Some of these erratics, I don't wanna say they're the size of this room, that would be a slight exaggeration, but they're larger than a Volkswagen. They're huge stuff. Some come to light if you're digging a hole for your cellar and you're digging out a hole, some of these will come to light. If you couldn't afford, as many people couldn't, if you couldn't afford a proper stone being carved up in Connecticut someplace and then transported by horse and wagon, then onto a ship across the sound, then onto a horse and wagon, then to the site, all of this after you've ordered the thing to begin with, if you didn't have the resources to mark, to memorialize the grave site of, of who had passed away, um, you unashamedly, I hope, <laughs> would go out in search of a nicely shaped, not a jagged random piece of rock. You don't, you don't want that because again, you're, you're transforming that found rock into a headstone. And so you're searching for something that has its own natural shape that's kind of conducive to being used as a, as a marker. These happen to be two, the only two at this site in Kutchog, and there are, uh, that's out on the North Fork and there are about 550 grave markers there, only two of which are these, and this, this picture doesn't capture it, but the one to the right actually has the initials HH carved into it. That's all we know about this individual. And these are my favorites because these are sort of, I don't know, primitive art in a way. So that's the stone type. Now I wanna briefly go through and then we'll get to the programming part, which is really what we're, what we're leading up to. How are we doing for time? I don't wanna lose track of that. Uh, I'm sorry? 25, great, okay. So if we get into conditions, I wanna make the distinction and we'll be seeing this again, those of you who are interested in going out to the workshop, um, there are things that volunteers can quite adequate, more than adequately do. And then there are things that they can't or shouldn't. And so it's important to distinguish between these because if you have work or repair, something that needs to be done, and it's beyond the capability or uh, of a normal uh, volunteer uh, skills, skill level, then that's the time to bring in a professional who will undertake the repairs that are needed. And there are ways of mitigating the condition or the vulnerability of a stone if you don't have those resources and still improve its chances for survival. So there's kind of a little, there's, a, there's another subset of that. But uh, we find, very, very successful cleaning projects of a stone such as this. This is marble. Again, you can kind of see that this one ought to be white. The white's kind of sh shining through there. Uh, this is hosting this kind of interesting red mold and, and other biogrowth. This just needs a good cleaning. That's all it needs. Uh, I, I recall, you know, we, we worked on this later and uh, didn't need resetting of any kind. So this is the simplest repair, if you will, 
it's important to understand cleaning is not a major intervention. The purpose of it really twofold. One is if, if the inscription is difficult to decipher, in many cases, it will, it will greatly increase the chances of your being able to read it uh, and to take a photograph to share with others however you wish. So that's one important thing. Uh, it also says to the passerby that this is a site that's being cared for. And you want that. A fence, a sign, and clean stones are the three things that really will say to the casual observer that someone cares for this sacred and historic place. So cleaning has a very important role you know, in, in, in that universe. Now you have your marble. Marble is soft, relatively speaking. As stone and rock goes, it's pretty soft, pretty vulnerable, especially this poor guy. It looks like he set into one of those bases, but actually he wasn't. Some well-meaning, and we often say, no repair is a bad repair, because any repair is evidence of concern and intervention on behalf of the stone. Even if the technique is wrong, the materials are wrong, the thing falls apart, it, you know, one of the interesting major conditions we often are failed repairs. It's a very common condition to address. In this case, I don't see any evidence of a repair, except that base is actually a box of concrete that's, that's poured concrete meant to support the stone. Well, concrete is many times harder than the stone that it's encircling. And all you need to do is give that poor tablet a bit of a whack and it's gonna break. And it's gonna break close to where it's embedded in the concrete, which will not give it up. And then after that's broken and fallen backwards onto the ground, we know it's backwards now because the inscription is faced up, okay? So it fell on its back. And when it did that, or shortly thereafter, it broke again, okay? So now we have a marble tablet in three pieces with this glob of concrete grabbing onto the bottom of it. So what are we, because that marble in the middle there in, goes down into the ground. It's just somebody thought by sticking concrete on it, it would hold it up. Well, that was the beginning of the end for that stone. So the treatment here would be that of very carefully cutting that concrete away. So you need a generator and a saw and a stone conservator that knows how to work with this and get the concrete off the marble. And then you simply reattach those, those three pieces. But that's a very time consuming repair, time translating into cost. Uh, and pretty much precipitated by the well-meaning amateur conservator, you know, 60 years ago, who thought that if we just put concrete all around these things, it'll keep them up forever. You know, the age of concrete. The other is this business of hauling these pieces. These may be footstones or headstones, small ones, hauling them off to the nearest tree to get them out of harm's way. Um, that succeeds in putting them in a safer spot so the mower is not going over them anymore. But the work here would be that of matching these up to, to other stones and perhaps reuniting them. So that's a common condition. So we were talking about what uh, volunteers can do. You can straighten a stone if it's tilting. There are techniques for simply digging out around the bottom and bringing it up to, to, to plumb again. And uh, that requires some training, some familiarity with the materials. You, you, know, you don't want to use, uh, you can use a metal shovel, but if you're careful not to get near the stone, then you have to switch to plastic tools. So your trowels and anything that's coming anywhere near the stone can't be metal because it's going to scrape the stone. Uh, so that's about setting it up right. And with sufficient experience and some initial training, that is certainly something that volunteers can do. We always talk about safety, however, the, the, the most important thing, especially let's say you're with a historical society and you have a crew that's gonna come out on a Saturday afternoon and do some cleaning and maybe some straightening. Typically, uh, most of the individuals are not familiar with that site. So you don't wanna walk backwards because you're gonna trip over a footstone and you're gonna end up falling to the ground and you might clunk your head on the way down. So there's a safety issue uh, that's paramount. 
Also, if you're working with a very heavy stone and it stands this high and you, all you're doing is you're straightening it a bit, well, the stone might weigh four or 500 pounds. So once you've loosened it up and you've dug out at the base where you're gonna bring it back to level, it's at a ver very vulnerable, it's not something you do by yourself. Um, it's at a vo very vulnerable point where it could fall over. So you, you need to be aware of the fact that, and then if you're underneath this or you're, you're uh, unwitting colleague is has his or her foot in the wrong spot. Uh, so those are the kinds of things you have to be very, very aware of, but they can be done. And then a stone that is complete and has fallen and needs to, let's say, be dug out of the ground to some extent can be reset. That's similar to the straightening. You're not repairing anything. You're just resetting it in the ground. That's typically a condition of foot stones that for whatever reason have come out of the ground and you know, they can be reset. So those are really the things that volunteers can do. Repairs beyond that, such as this, this is an example of an old repair. There are two here. The one with the sort of the V-shaped, uh, that stone had fallen and cracked and been reattached somewhat pretty successfully. The one to the left, we, here we have the age of, the golden age of concrete again, using concrete as an adhesive so here we're slabbing the, you know, the two pieces to, to, and concrete is somewhat adhesive. I mean, it sticks to stuff. Okay. So in this case, it's being used as an adhesive. Um, the thought being better to have Hannah, wife of Nathan, up in the air, upright, vertical, than to have her down on the ground where the mowers are going over. There's no question. So no repair is a bad repair. It's just this needs to be better. Um, and it's easily done. However, Hannah, Hannah's parts have to be pulled apart again. The concrete has to be removed. These two pieces are probably heavy enough that they need to be pinned, uh, drilled up and down. So about an eight to 10 inch pin is now inserting up and down and then structural adhesive, and then it goes back together again. So that's time consuming. Now, here's another condition that we encounter from time to time. It's the case of the wandering headstone. I got to know little Henry pretty well because he was in the trunk of my car for quite a while. I uh, got a phone call. I was working at a historical society and a lady said, I have a, found a headstone in my garage. And I, Do you want it? You know, I'd like to put him back where he belongs. So some of these stories have a, get, take a twist. Uh, so I said, well, sure, you know, we'll do what we can. So, so I get Henry and he goes into the trunk of my car and uh, he's a little white marble. First, she thought it was a, a mile marker because we were doing a project in an area on Eastern Long Island that still every mile has its mile markers from the 19th century. And this was kind of the same shape. I'm like, this is not a mile marker. This is Henry's headstone. So let's see if we can repatriate Henry back to this. So with a little bit of research, I discovered that Henry's family, the Tuttles, this is the North Fork Tut Hill, the ones on the South Shore, T-U-T-T-L-E. So you got the Tuttle, Tut Hills and the Tuttles. Okay, so, so Henry's family, he was a little guy, right? He was seven months old when he died. His family, farming family moved all the, the, he's in Kutchoff. They moved all the way west to Matatuck, which is two miles down the road. So their circumstances were improving, but poor little Henry had gone into the ground at the age of seven months. They weren't about to take Henry with them. So Henry gets left behind. Family moves to another nearby farming communities. And, you know, fate, takes its hand here and members of the family proceed to pass away over time. And the Tuttle family memorializes the passing. There you have your plates there that can be updated. Uh, memorialize those who are passing away with this large, wonderful zinc monument. Okay. So, Henry. There he is. So what happens is they, they don't take Henry with them. Henry was in a box 40 years ago. And that was part of our life in Kutchoff. So that was Henry and his stone. 
But many years later, when we're memorializing the various members of the family who, after the years pass, pass away, et cetera, et cetera, we find space up there on the column to memorialize little Henry, who was a part of the family, and we want the whole family together here. So in a sense, you've rendered Henry's marble marker redundant. It's no longer serving a purpose, and we don't know where the gravesite was because the stone managed to wander off from that and end up in the, on the lady's porch or in her barn or something. So, um, so he became a gift. His stone became a gift to the local historical society because I needed him to not be living in the trunk of my car indefinitely. Um, now, I'm going to quickly go because I'm sure we're down to the last few minutes here. So public programs. Here's Miriam uh, and Parthenia. Daughters, et cetera, you can read them. Okay, here's an instance in which a grave marker is a unique record of that individual. These little girls, if you look at the dates, one dies 1822, the other 54, they weren't picked up on the local census records. These were African-American girls who were born, who lived, and who died, and were buried. And this is the only record that that ever happened. Now, the reason this was discovered, if you ever work with a Boy Scout, which is tremendous fun, I can't recommend it enough. But if you give a 17-year-old a shovel, he's going to dig his way halfway to China before you tell him the hole is big enough. His job was to reset, here he is, Joe. If you look all the way in the background, they're not the headstones, but there's a row of stones that are spaced every 10 feet just inside where those two, where those trucks are parked. And those are stone fence posts. That was the Cadillac of picket fences in the middle of the 19th century. Those are roughly hewn stones drilled out to support the wooden railing and the wooden pickets. So all that wood has disappeared, but those stones are still there. They encircle this site every 10 feet. And Joe's job was to dig out some of those and to straighten them because we were putting up a new fence in front of them and to reattach broken pieces, et cetera. So he, in the act of digging out one of those crooked, and these things, again, it's the two thirds, one third thing. These weigh about five or 600 pounds and out of the ground, they're like this high. So he's digging this great big hole. And what he finds in the hole are a couple of little headstones that were used to straighten it back up again, way back. So out of the hole comes the headstone. And I'm thinking this is Providence because those gate, uh, those uh, fence posts spaced every 10 feet, there are probably about 200 of them there. And this is the only hole that he dug. Just saying. So he discovers that, resets the stone. We had a big debate next to where the mother is buried, which seemed logical because we now have no bearings. Where, where, where should the stone go? So that's working with, and there they are, Miriam, and that's Parthenia, Reeve, Saloni, daughters of, that's the family. These had been enslaved. This is late. This is now the 18, you know, 30s, 40s. Uh, Alexander dies in 1881. He, he was born a slave, his, as was his wife. Uh, and Alimus Reeve, also born 18, um, I think that's 16. So, so that's the transition period on the Eastern Long Island from uh, African Americans who are either who are born as slaves and achieve their remissions, uh, manumission. So, so that was a tremendous discovery, and that was all a Boy Scout project. So I recommend that highly. Is use that, uh, use those those kids as resources if if you can. The other most normal sort of public programming would be that of giving a tour. Uh, we're in Quag here. We had done some restoration work, which we talked about, but to make it interesting, I mean, most people, a general audience isn't necessarily willing to come out and look at stones that you fixed kind of thing. It's like, that's kind of a real niche, narrow kind of, but they are interested in hearing the stories of some of the individuals whose, whose stones are there, who have a unique and interesting, you know, whatever it is. And so we, uh, and, using Google and these search engines, uh, 
it's an awful lot easier to research people now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And it's tremendous fun. So if you just 10 stones is a good number for about an hour long tour. And you just research as many as you can, and then you come up with the 10 or so most interesting uh, stories associated with that individual. And that's what we did here. We were given money to repair some of the stones, but we wanted to add a public component to it that would give more reason for repairing the stones than just saying we want to get them back up straight again and cleaner. So a public tour is, is a very, uh, usually a very popular thing. And here we have <coughs> a group of people uh, somewhat paying attention to me or putting up with me or whatever. Maybe this was probably the beginning of the tour. Later on, they sort of wander off and hope, you, hope you're getting to the end. And the other thing, which is similar to what we were planning to do today, although I think we're going to be, you know, we're going to have to modify, and it's more of a hands-on thing, <laughs> excuse me, is to host a workshop. Now, a workshop has the word work in it. And when I was Southampton town historian, we, the town owns 10 of these sites, and every year we hosted one or two of these. And I learned over time that if we called it a workshop, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we got less and less attendance because it sounded like you really had to you know, work. Uh, but people caught on and eventually started coming with lawn chairs. So they, and in sandals. So they were clearly not planning to do any work whatsoever. They just want to sit there and watch what was happening, which is fine. But in this case, um, typically you would have someone come who has the skills to do some work that is unusual or substantial, something more than what you would expect a group of volunteers to do. Uh, you can do some cleaning, like this volunteer is doing here. So this is engaging people in doing something productive, making a real contribution to the site. Uh, sometimes you can get make a team of two. Uh, even start digging. This was one of the one of my powerful volunteers. She was give me the shovel and stop talking. <laughs> type, you know. And, uh, and then, you know, here's one of these, a couple of sub, a base and a sub base where you've got a major tablet, which is in the background somewhere there, uh, which had been supported on these pins. Uh, you can see one to, to the left and then with some amount of adhesive in between. So in conjunction with the professional hoisting this heavy thing up in the air with, with, a, with a major hoist and actually doing some of the professional work, then, you can assist in this is cleaning that base before the before the tablet gets reset. And here's our conservator to the right a guy named Joel Snodgrass. Um, this guy on the left showed up. He operates cranes when you in, in New York or any large city when you see a crane that is swinging something really, really heavy up in the air up to the hundredth floor or something. He's the guy that operates that. So he's the kind of volunteer you want because he was very skilled and he became an assistant. It's a rare moment to have someone with that level of skill, but, but he jumped in and he's assisting. And now we have a bunch of guys, that's that zinc marker, which was simply crooked. And you can see it's one big thing. Uh, the fellow at the top, Jonathan Appel, is a professional conservator. These other guys showed up for the day and they're simply resetting it on a, on a level base. So that's the workshop idea. The final thing uh, is working with students. This again is up in Kachag. You can see those stone posts in the background. Um, I have found these, these happen to have been seniors because there was some sort of a, like a history day, but the kid wasn't specifically that, it was about community day. And these kids were like, for whatever reason, the school administration wanted to get rid of these kids for the day. I think they were doing something with the juniors. So they needed to get the seniors out of the building and they canvass all the local nonprofits. Can you take on, you know, four or five, six kids, uh, do something with them that's productive. I'm like, I can keep them all day, keep them all week. So we had six seniors, and in this case, they have a stone that they've taken out. They're going to reset. The kids really get into this. Uh, they become like junior conservators, and you go through the whole safety thing and the significance of what's happening, and they 
actually love it and and get some work done and have a memorable uh, day. We always used to take a picture because this wonderful obelisk, uh, which has not been cleaned as yet, uh, had been erected to Elizabeth Mapes, uh, our teacher, uh, because she must have been well loved in the community, particularly by the students who, when they uh, reached adulthood or whatever, passed the plate and managed to erect a pretty significant monument in her memory. And that's where we always took the group photo. So the idea of using uh, students, sometimes they need um, credits, you know, community credits. Matt, I think we have a... Before we get to that, we have yes. one from online. Oh, okay. Have you heard of wet and forget, and is it okay to use on stones? Wet and forget? Was that the... Yeah, that is the phrase. For the person that sent it, why don't you write in and tell us what wet and forget is, and we'll come back to you. Commercial product. Okay. Uh, I was about to say, I've never heard of it, but I can imagine that it is just as you said, it's a commercial product. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I don't know that product and therefore I wouldn't want to recommend it, but I can say is the product that we use, and this has been many years of experimentation, the National Park Service has, after years of using various kinds of things, uh, endorses the use of something called D, initial D, slash two, D2. And D2 is an antimicrobial. In other words, it's killing that, the lichen, the moss, the molds, et cetera. Uh, it's not a clean, it, it kind of cleans the stone in the sense that it gets rid of all that discolors, uh, but it's not a cleaning agent. So D2 is what we use. It is now rather, it used to be kind of hard to find. You can't go to Home Depot, they don't sell it, uh, or your local hardware stores. It used to be hard to find. It's, it's relatively costly. It's, going to run about $50 a gallon. Um, and so if you've spent $50 on a gallon of D2 and you go out to use it on a windy day, half your product is lost to the wind. And then if it rains tomorrow, the rest of your product is. So it's really important if you're trying to conserve your materials and make them work for you and not blow your budget is to time this such that um, you use it on a day that's fairly calm. One way to improve it is to moisten the stone first. So the D2, which is obviously a liquid, isn't also acting because if it's hot out, it's gonna dry out a little more quickly. So typically you moisten the stone, spray on the D2. And if you're doing a workshop and you're hosting people and they're really, really anxious to see some results, we're so impatient as a, as a, as a nation. I don't need to see the results right away. You can get out the, the bristle brush and kind of scrub it and rinse it down and you will see an immediate improvement. But if you have 550 stones, that's a lot of manpower. And if the average age of your volunteers is over 50, you're never gonna get there. So the other way to use the product, which I've heard from the horse's mouth, the guy that invented this stuff is spray it and walk away. Okay. You don't need to scrub it. Because the real action is it, it soaks into the stone a bit and it cleans over time. So you're not going to get that immediate result, but it will do the job. And I have found personally, I like to do it in October or November, because I know that I'm not going to be out at that site for another three or four months anyway. And the stuff just sits there. And you come back in March and, you know, it's kind of a major improvement. Sometimes you have to apply it more than once. But, but that's the timing of it, is to conserve that product. But that's the official approved cleaning agent. Uh, there's no bleach in it. There's no, nothing harmful that's going to uh, create any uh, deterioration of the stone material. Yeah, yeah. In the back, I'm sorry. You can't see her behind the light. Hi, Karen Devil in town of Marion. Um, I was talking to, we have several, we have a cemetery and several burying grounds. Okay. And the burying grounds are under the offices of the town. Yep. And the cemetery has a cemetery association. Okay. And our cemetery has quite a few stones that need cleaning. Mm -hmm. And I talked to them at one point about doing it and getting a group of people together to come out and help do it. And right. I was told that 
we needed to get the permission of the families who were involved with the stone to do it, even though the stones were like 100 years old. Okay, well, that would be very unusual. If, if you have an active cemetery association, which is at that particular site and is managing that, uh, and there are still family members, if, they're, if it's still open, I mean, it's, it's historical because it has stones that may be a hundred or more years old, but it still has room for more and it's still being managed by the essentially a family association or whatever it may be called then there's a closer relationship to who owns the stone, sort of, okay. Typically, you absolutely need the permission of the owner of the site. So if it's the town, the town has to, because there are insurance issues, there are all sorts of exposure that whoever owns the site is theoretically, you know, needs to, to think about. And so you, if it's the church, if it's the town, whoever that owner of record is needs to grant permission for you to be there in the first place. And just as I approached Riverside and said, we're a bunch of historians and we know what we're doing and we'd love to come and visit you and they're wonderful and very receptive, but I needed their permission for us to show up and start cleaning stones. But as to the individual who owns it, for the most part, that's really not a thing, okay? It certainly isn't in these, if it's a town owned burying ground or cemetery, depending on the age of it, um, it was as in, in the case of uh, Long Island, where the towns laid these sites out to begin with. Here's where the meeting house goes. Here's where the schoolhouse is gonna go. Here's where our burying ground is gonna go. They owned the site. It was free for all the citizens to use, and maybe the Hallex would stake out a little corner over there next to the tree. That's where we're going to put us. And all this gets sort of worked out. But the town owned it. And in effect, they owned those after 100 or two or 300 years. They own the stones. There's no family member. Um, I've, I've never encountered that as an issue, that you need to get the permission. That just sounds like a kind of a, a sort of an exaggerated, made up stumbling block. To, 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 to simplify the discussion over whether you ought to be here or not. It's like, oh no, you got, and that person's been dead for 200 years. So that's gonna be kind of tough to get their permission. But technically that, that, that's, that's, I don't think that's really a, ever an issue. Can I open Pandora's box? Uh, well, is it a coffin or is it, is it Pandora's coffin or is it Pandora's box? What about cemeteries that don't have an owner? Okay, so here in the state of the wonderful empire state, there's a system for this, okay? And the system, after the cemetery board and that whole department was created, I think it's back in the 30s, um, from that point forward, any cemetery that was created had to be incorporated as a nonprofit, had to be formally listed and chartered and known of and all the rest of it and sort of participate in the system. There were, however, I think the number is correct, there was something like 17,000 cemeteries and burying grounds across the state that already existed. Those were approached to be brought into the tent to incorporate, et cetera, et cetera, and to be regulated. The problem that we get into now are these sites which fall into this gray area. They're essentially closed. They're not open or active for burials. Um, they're sitting on the tax rolls as these parcels and usually labeled cemetery or something or other, but the ownership is ambiguous. The state handles this, that after 14 years of there having been no evidence of maintenance, that site is technically considered abandoned. And with abandonment, the town, which is the lowest level of subdivision, you know, it's not a village, it's the town that is obligated statewide to take possession, just acknowledge ownership. And with that, they accept the responsibility of maintaining them. So um, that's where that, but there are many towns who are like, eh, I've never heard of that law because we don't want to have a site that we have to mow and, and repair the fence. Well, then you have to sort of go to, go to battle with the town attorney and remind them and 
get the citation of what the law is. And yes, in fact, the town yeah. owns it. Yeah, yes, John. Zach, I think yeah. that law is very specific and it mm -hmm. defines uh, an abandoned cemetery. And it, yeah. that doesn't mean these family cemeteries that are on private property. Okay. It means right. an incorporated cemetery or one that was a church cemetery where the church has yes. left okay. or something like that. Right. That's a very, thank you, John. Very important distinction. There are still many burial plots, if you will. Uh, maybe it's on a little hill. It's still on a 30 acre piece of property. It's still privately owned. That's not what we're talking about here. These would be parcels which have their own boundaries and were maintained over the years by descendants of people who just accepted responsibility. Dad gave me the lawnmower and now I'm the guy that has to go. But these are properties that have their own boundaries. The biggest challenge are the sites that John's referring to, which are clusters of headstones, which are still situated on private property. And the law does not cover that. You know, uh, that's a huge, huge challenge. And we have them, I mean, in rural areas, this is a very common, uh, common thing. But there's no, there's no simple answer to how, to how to fix that. You just need to approach uh, the owner and suggest that your intentions are to try to save these old records. And that doesn't mean that other people, I will say one way of making that case stronger is that either using find a grave, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with from doing research, uh, where you can search and find the picture of a stone by the name or a newer one, which is the rival for find a grave, which is our favorite is billiongraves.com, billion graves. And the advantage of that is Where's my cell phone? Okay. So you download the app into your phone. Then you go out and when you take a picture, you, op you take the picture in their app and it tags the photo with the unique coordinates of where you're standing. And if you go through a site of 50 or 100, however many pictures you take, it builds a map of the site. And then when you, you, you do your searching as you would have in Find a Grave, the only advantage here is that it, it produces a map and you can see where, where Charlie is because he's in the third row because it, he has him on a map. At home, you, build, you, you enter the data in addition to the picture, but that's the advantage of billion graves. Yes, sir. Hang on. Yeah. This is the last question because we're running up against time and you okay. have to drive to another place. Shortly. Five minutes and I'll give you direct. Oh, I already gave you directions. Okay. Yes. Jason Parkman, Town Historian. Uh, yes, follow up to the uh, Billion Graves thing. How do we know about the accuracy of the coordinates on your phone if, let's say, mm -hmm. on Google Maps or something, it tends to show you a bit off or away from okay. where you actually are? I would say it's about 99%, and that technology is getting better and better. Um, you know, that whole coordinates that were available to us mortals and not the military that had a higher grade of all this because they needed it, presumably, when all this was first invented. It's now to the point where it's accurate to less than a foot. And so stones that are next to each other are still like a couple of feet apart. And if you just as a test, you do one, you do the other, and you look at the coordinates, they're different. Okay, so it will accurately now, every once in a while, something weird happens, and they, they're big on Eagle Scouts, and so they have a whole page of instructions to have an Eagle Scout candidate go out and record a whole site, and that becomes a whole activity, which is interesting. But I had an Eagle Scout doing that, and the burying ground was next to a grocery store, and one of the stones ended up on the roof. And at first, I thought, that brat must have been sitting on the roof having his lunch. And then I realized that the, the thing got screwy. So I don't know, the cloud, something something. But typically, it works really well. And the whole purpose of it is to orient you once you're at the site to find the stone. And if it's a little off from what it is, it serves the purpose. So, Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your taking the time um, to listen to this. Um, we will, those of, those of you who have enrolled in the workshop, I haven't been outside. We have no idea what it's doing out anymore. But if it's really, really raining, then I'm going to say we'll go down there We'll run into the chapel. We'll get a wonderful introduction to Riverside Cemetery. There's a bathroom there. We will probably go out to the tent and assess the situation. But none of us wants to spend the afternoon here in Oswego in the rain. That's just not a happy prospect. So we'll, we'll play that by ear. Thanks again. We'll see you down there. Folks, if you have not done so already, please put your uh, evaluations in the folder on the table. And to those that are watching virtually, 
We will try and get something out to you in the next few days so you can evaluate us. We tried this morning, it didn't work. So we're gonna try and fix the glitch. Thank you everybody for coming. The conference is officially over.